if you're a medical student who hasn't got the faintest clue about research and would like a publication and some skills, then this video is for you. Hopefully the mic will make the experience of watching these videos slightly better. Um, I made it a point not to buy too many things to start this YouTube channel because I didn't want to use that as an excuse not to start. And since I've stuck with it for about two months now, I figured it wouldn't be a bad idea to spend another 10 quid on a mic. Okay, so let's get started. Hi everyone, welcome back. My name is Sarah. I'm a junior doctor working near London. And in this video, we are going to be talking about publications. Now, when I was in medical school, it really felt like publications was a very taboo subject. Students in my year would magically come out with publications and nobody talked about the process. You just had to blindly figure it out. It felt like such a shame because it made the information less accessible and felt like unnecessary competition. I vividly remember looking online and trying to find information about publications and how to even get started because I really felt clueless. Um, and I couldn't really find a concise breakdown. There were some YouTubers that talked about their experience, but nobody really broke down the process in a way that was clear enough for someone like me to just get started and get a publication during my medical school years. It's a shame because the whole point of research is to make advancements and improve the quality of the work that we do to provide better care for patients. And this really felt like the antithesis. This video is not for you if you want to learn about advanced research techniques or how to run a randomized control trial. I am by no means an expert on the topic, but that's not what you need. If you're a medical student who hasn't got the faintest clue about research and publications and would like a relatively easy way to enter the realm of research and come out with a publication and some skills, then this video is for you. I'm going to take you through a step-by-step -step process to publish your first paper. Again, this may not be the most advanced way to do it, but it's what worked for me. And if you want the ABCs of publications, then you're in the right place. I'm going to break down this video into three sections. The first part is going to cover why to publish. The second part will be about the easiest types of publications that you can focus on. And finally, I'll take you through a step-by-step -step process for publishing your first paper and tips and strategies that I use that made the whole process so much easier. So let's tackle the first part. Why to publish? I think one of the main reasons to do anything in life is to experiment because maybe you've never done any research at all, you don't really know what it's about. And who knows, you might actually end up being super interested in research and that could change the whole course of your career. And even if you don't end up being passionate about research, it's really important to understand how the process works because the day that you actually find your calling in life or you find what you enjoy in medicine and what specialty you want to do, then you'll have the skills to be able to do research and look into things that interest you in that particular field. Whichever way you look at it, it's gonna end up being super useful for your career, whether it be academic or clinical. Another point that makes research so important is that it improves the overall quality of care. The whole point of research is to make advancements and improve how things work. So if you're involved in research, however little, you may be contributing to improving the quality of care for patients. And if you've chosen medicine as a vocation, then that should be pretty important. That is not to say that you undermine the other advantages, such as getting more FPAS points. So you have a grand total of two publication points that can count towards your foundation program application course. And two points can be quite significant if you look at the scoring system. So being able to publish um, two papers in medical school and getting those two points can actually be really helpful to help you pick your location and what type of jobs you want during your foundation program. And even if you don't care about the foundation program scoring, whatever you do in life, this will follow you. It's something that goes onto your CV and I'm not gonna lie, it looks really great. Let's talk about part two. There are countless different types of publications ranging from letters to randomized control trials and meta-analyses, but that's not what this video is about. This video is about getting you from point A with no publications or any experience to point B with a publication and skills in research using the quickest route possible. So the two types of publications that I want to talk about are case studies and letters to the editor. A case study is pretty much what it says on the tin. So it's a study of a particular case. This could be about a patient with a very rare disorder or a patient presenting with a very unusual combination um, of symptom presentations for a particular condition that we know a lot about. It could also be about very interesting post-operative complications that were seen in patients. Essentially, anything that's rare or interesting and that's not been seen before. So this type of research is on the weaker side of the scale because it's not on a massive group of people and it's not randomizing um, anything at all. It's just talking about one particular case and the point of it is to raise questions and to perhaps encourage further research in that area. The second type of easy publication is a letter to the editor. 
editor. Again, pretty self-explanatory. So all you're doing is writing a letter to the editor of a journal. So let's say somebody's done a research project and has published a research paper in a journal. They have a study and they've come up with concluding points. You can read that paper and here's where it's helpful to have some level of understanding of how to analyze a research paper and how to interpret it. So you can have a look at the concluding points and maybe you'll find that perhaps there's some errors in the study or they're jumping to very broad conclusions. You may also think that it's a great research paper and you want to add something new to it. In that case, you can write a letter to the editor. So you'll be responding to that research paper and the key is to add something new to what's already been written but more about that later. Well done for making it this far. We're now getting to the best bit. So I'm going to take you through a step-by-step -step process of how to write a letter to the editor and how to write a case study. That way you have the choice to do both or either one, whatever you prefer. Let's start with letter to the editor. So point number one, work with a group. Try to find at least two to three people who want to write a publication as well and are relatively hardworking. You'll each be writing one letter to the editor and cross-correcting each other. By the end of it, with a third of the work, you'll be able to get three publications out of this. Assuming that you have no experience at all with these letters, the next part is going to be inspiration. So what I want you to do is go on PubMed and type in a few keywords. Things that work really well are medical school, medical students' perspective, or just medical students. When you look up those keywords, you'll find a bunch of different letters that medical students have written. So you'll pick up a framework that repeats itself a lot in terms of the structure and also in terms of what they add to the paper and how they make it something new. Looking at examples for inspiration is by far the quickest way you can get a certain level of understanding of what you're supposed to be writing and what it's supposed to look like. While I can't tell you exactly what topic to pick for your letter, I can definitely give you some pointers. So make sure that what you pick is time sensitive. So that means that you are responding to a research paper that's been published recently at least in the last two to three months. Anything more than that will reduce your chances of adding anything relevant at all. Make sure it's something topical, so something that's been talked about or that has some level of traction. Pick something that's achievable, so don't look at a research paper that's extremely complicated and there's a massive study that you barely understand because chances are, if you don't understand it, you're not gonna be able to add anything relevant. Again, use PubMed, have a flick through the journals and look at what's topical at the moment and what's achievable for you. The last point I want to mention is to exploit your position. As a medical student, you have a unique perspective that not a lot of people have. So as in our second point, when you're looking for inspiration, you'll see a lot of letters to the editor where medical students will talk about their perspective as medical students and how that can influence the conclusions. And you'll find that that's a very easy way to add something new to research just by being yourself, a medical student. Once you've got a topic in mind, point number four is to find the journal that you're going to publish in. Ideally, you want to look for a journal that has a high impact factor. So that's how many times it gets cited. Um, and the higher the better. Don't worry too much about this because it's okay to start at a lower impact journal. If you're doing this primarily for your foundation program application score, make sure that whatever journal uh, you want to publish in is going to have a PubMed ID. So basically that it can come up when you do a PubMed search. That's the only type of paper that gets counted for those two points. With any journal, it's very important to look at the author guidelines. So do this bit before you write up your paper. Now that's very important. Just go onto their website, go to author guidelines and look at the specific guidelines for that publication you want. Oftentimes, uh, different journals have very different guidelines in terms of the maximum word count, whether or not you need an abstract, and if you're allowed to have references. So that gives you a good set of rules that you need to abide by before writing your structure. Now that you've got your group, you've got your inspiration and your topic, and you've picked a journal that you want to publish in, the next step is writing it up. So I know this can be intimidating and you feel like you don't know where to start. Hopefully the second step of inspiration will have given you a good idea of what the structure is supposed to look like. If you have a look at even five or 10 letters, you'll see that they all follow the same broad structure. As you can see here, they'll first cite the article and the authors, quickly summarizing what was said in the paper. Oftentimes it's gonna start like this. We read with great interest the article entitled blah, blah, blah by X, Y, and Z. It's good practice to congratulate the authors on their study. And after that, you go through your points. And like I said before, these need to be an addition, whether you're adding onto the paper or you're criticizing some points that were done. Make sure you stay professional and finally end with your concluding points. Et voilà, you've written a letter. You don't need to write free form straight away. I would write bullet points in each of these sections so that you make sure you have some tangible content in your letter and then you can put it all together in full sentences and you'll see it comes together pretty quickly if you follow these steps. Let's talk about the second type of publication, so case studies. You'll find that a lot of the steps repeat themselves from how to write a letter, but there are a few differences. 
For a case study, point number one, find your group. Now that's not going to be another group of medical students. What you want to do here is find a senior doctor in the hospital, whether that be a registrar or a consultant, you want somebody who can guide you through the process. That will be particularly helpful in the beginning if you've never written something before. And on top of that, they can save you a lot of time and be really good at picking out the cases that are actually worth writing a case study for. They've got years of experience, so they know what a good case study looks like. On a very important side note, most medical students will have experience of doing lots of data collection or writing up a whole paper to publish with the help of a senior doctor and end up not getting anywhere with it and never getting a publication out of it. This can take hours and hours of your time. And while you will definitely learn skills from that, it's not the best way to do things. It's really hard to predict whether a paper is going to come to fruition and if all that effort is going to lead to something. I've had more of my fair share of failed papers where I've spent hours and hours working on something and it's sputtered and died for a multitude of reasons. One of the best things you can do is research that doctor before you ask them for help with your case study. In each hospital, you'll have some doctors who are very involved in research and have had a lot of publications. Those are the ones that you want to speak to. It might seem really obvious, but it completely changes the game. So just look them up on PubMed or ResearchGate and see how active they are in the world of research. It's not a foolproof method, but if they are active in research, then you're more likely to get somewhere with your publication. It helps if you find a doctor in a particular specialty that you're interested in, because they're more likely to be invested in you um, if you show interest. But it's okay if that's not the case. You'll still end up with hopefully a publication, skills and some level of contribution. If you're wondering why a senior doctor would want to help you with any type of research, it comes down to mutual benefit. You as a medical student have a lot more time, even though you don't think so, than a senior doctor. So they have the experience and they can guide you through the whole process and you have the time to do the data collection, to do the drafts and they can correct you as you go along. So if you find the right person to work with, you can both really benefit from this. So again, step two is similar, looking at inspiration. So go on to PubMed and look at different case studies. You'll see after having read five or 10 of them, they all follow a pretty similar structure. So that gives you a good idea of the framework and what type of concluding points people come up with. Point three, so picking a topic, that should already be taken care of point number one, which was to find a senior doctor. So they will hopefully tell you what an interesting case study is. At this point, you want to ask them specifically what makes that case interesting, what can be learned from this case and how to convey this. What makes a case study interesting is not necessarily the case study itself, but the learning points that you can get from it. And in the beginning, when you don't have any experience, it can be difficult to focus on the right things. So use that senior doctor and ask them these questions so that you can focus on the right things when you're writing your case study. Next point, as before, is picking your journal. So again, look at journals with a high impact factor and find ones that are known for publishing case studies. Again, in this case, a senior doctor will be really helpful in helping you pick the most appropriate journal for your case study. You then get to structure, so writing up your case study. You'll find that the inspiration part where you looked at different case studies is going to be super helpful because you should now have a rough idea of how to write it up. They all follow the same format, so you'll see that they start off with an introduction of the case study, delve into the details of the history, examination, investigations, anything that was interesting in that particular point. They'll oftentimes have a picture of the investigations that were done, like a scan. And finally, end with the concluding comments as well as the learning points, which which makes this study interesting. You've now got the draft of a case study which your senior doctor can review and edit and hopefully you'll be able to publish that. As before, make sure you look at the author guidelines before writing your case study so that you know what rules to follow. The last point I want to make for both studies is that there is no shortcut. It's going to take time. Even if you find the best group to work with or the best senior doctor to help you with your case study, submitting a publication takes time. You'll probably need to write a couple of drafts which will be edited. And once you've sent it to a journal, it needs to go through an editing process. So they may send you back some notes asking you to make some changes. Once all that is done and hopefully your paper gets accepted, it can take a couple of months for your paper to actually come out in the journal issue. That's completely normal. And like anything that is worth something in life, it does take a little bit of perseverance. I hope you found this video helpful and if you have any questions, drop them down below. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I will see you in the next video. Bye.